<clears throat> All right, whenever you're, you're ready, let me know. All right. Hey, good morning. I wish we were here with you this morning. Strange things happen when you go to the beach. Um, a lot of people bring home things like souvenirs. Some people bring home shells. Everybody brings home sand. Um, some people bring home T-shirts, um, other kind of souvenirs. Lisa and I and my family, we went to the beach, and we brought home coronavirus. So um, we're not able to be with you today. Uh, and, man, we're bummed about it. Uh, Lisa's not feeling the greatest. She went to uh, the express care today, and it came back positive. So she's getting some medications, and we're getting that taken care of. Um, and I'm, I'm feeling like about 95%. Um, I have a little cough. That's basically about it. But for your protection and um, out of abundance of caution and care and love for you, we're putting this on today like this so that um, you'll still have, be uh, able to hear the word of God being preached um, through technology. Um, and that's kind of cool because we're going to talk about a little bit about technology today increasing um, because we're talking about a guy by the name, by the name of Noah today. Uh, we have looked at the Hebrew church, and we're going to continue looking at the Hebrew church. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to begin reading in verse 34. So if you will, stand with me. Um, even though I'm not here, I am standing. Um, and let's read God's word and see what it says, beginning in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. The writer says, for you had compassion, for you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have no need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry, for the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders attained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away, so that he did not see death, and was not found, because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, this is what we're going to talk about today. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you today, and even though um, we're, not, we're not physically with the congregation, Lord, I pray for each one here today. Um, I pray, Father, for each person that's present, Lord, for their relationship with you, that they would stand strong in their faith, their, their belief of you, even when things get hard. Lord, may you teach us and may you show us to have faith, even as Noah had faith for over a hundred years believing the promise that you gave to him that you were going to destroy this world with water. Father, you have
given us promise, a promise in your son that he too will come again and that he'll take us home. And so we are claiming that promise. We are believing that promise and we are holding to that promise. Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And I pray, Father, that if there's one here who does not know you, that today would be their day of salvation. And Father, through it all, I give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Normally he says it's up to me, but uh, we cut that part out of the video. Uh, additionally, let, let me go ahead and, and say this. Um, we, now is the time that we need to pray for our pastor and his wife. Also, we need to pray for Michael and Heather. They have COVID too, and she is pregnant. So we need to really pray for them too. So when the time comes to pray, we, we will, we will uh, pray for that. But in these times, where do we lean? Uh, on the everlasting arms, right? Let's sing about that. Fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Sing arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim's way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. of reading comes from Psalm 35 uh, verses 19 through 28. Do not let those who are wrongfully my enemies rejoice over me, nor let those who hate me without cause wink maliciously. They opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha! Aha, our eyes have seen it. You have seen it, O Lord. Do not keep silent, O Lord. Do not be far from me. Stir up yourself and awake to my right and to my cause, my God and my Lord. Do not let them say in their heart, Aha, our desire. Do not let them say, We have swallowed him up. Let them shout for joy and rejoice who favor my vindication. And let them say continually, The Lord be magnified who delights in the prosperity of his servants. And my tongue shall declare your righteousness and your praise all the day long. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. you have been 
And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise been studying the book of Hebrews, so grab your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and put something in there, and then uh, turn to Genesis chapter 6, because we're going to be looking at the story of Noah today. Um, And C.S. Lewis said this about the book of Hebrews. He said um, that an expanding soul will encounter an expanding Christ. And as we've looked at the book of Hebrews, we've realized that this book of Hebrews is amazing, and that Jesus is is supreme to everything. He's supreme to, to angels because he's created them. He's supreme to the, the world because he created it. He spoke it into existence. Um, he's supreme over the law. He's supreme over Moses. He was supreme over just everything. Uh, all the prophets and everything. He was supreme. He's, he is greater than all of those things. Um, and then we came to chapter 11. And in chapter 11, we started, and we started looking at it. We gave uh, faith a definition. And the definition was something like this. Allegiance to a duty or a person. A loyalty. A belief and trust in. A loyalty to God. A belief in the traditional doctrine of a religion. A firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Complete trust. Something that is believed. Especially with strong convictions, a system of religious beliefs. And one young boy said, faith is believing even when it gets hard. Um, and that's a great way of wrapping up what faith really is. Faith is believing any when it, even when it gets hard, even when it gets difficult. Um, and so we're going to look at a man today who believed God's word and believed God's promise even when it got hard, even when it got difficult. And as we look at this, um, we notice some things, especially in verse 7 uh, of chapter 11, that there's, if you count them, there's 41 words, 41 words um, on Noah. Now, when you read about Noah in Genesis, you find four full chapters, four full chapters dedicated to this person, Noah, and the building of an ark. So what is the author assuming? The author of Hebrews is assuming that the people knew who Noah was. He is assuming the stories about Noah were true, that Noah built an ark. Why is he assuming that? Because they are, after all, Hebrew. They are, after all, Jews. They would have been taught this story. They would have heard the story. They would have believed the story. This is what God did. Um, And so they would have believed that this was what happened and what took place. Um, And so we're also going to see in here, not only did he do that, but um, he's going to warn them of things. And Noah is going to believe of things that are going to take place even though he's never seen them. God has done the same for us. He is warning us of things to come even though we haven't seen them. And it's our choice to either believe those things or reject those things. And so the choice is, is and will be ours at that. So um, let, me, let me just start with this illustration. Um, do you remember the uh, cheerful weatherman from NBC's Today Show, Willard Scott? Bright, 
cheerful man, always smiling. Well, Lance Morrow wrote a grim humor piece in Time Magazine several years ago, um, expressing his despair at the world's ever-deeping plunge into evil. And this is what he said. He's, and it's rather lengthy, but it, it, it's really interesting. He says, I think, I, he says, I think there should be a dark Willard Scott. In the network studio in New York City, dark Willard would recite the morning's evil report. And the map of the world would be behind him. And there would be uh, all this multicolor projection going on. And some parts of the earth where the overnight good prevailed would glow with a bright transparency. But most of the map would be darkened. It would be darkened. Over third world and first world, over cities and plains and miserable islands would be these smudges of evil. Ragged blights. Storm systems of massacre of famine, of murders, of black snows, a genocide here and there, a true abyss. Dark Willard would then remark, homo homini lupus, which is Latin, and it means man is a wolf to man. Man is a wolf to man. And Dark Willard would add up all of the moral evils, the horrors accomplished overnight by man and woman, anything new among the suffering Kurds, the Central American death squads, the new hackings in Africa, Nigeria being torn apart, updating the father who set his son on fire, or in those, or the, those boys accused of, of killing their parents for their inheritance. The only depravity, Lance Morrow goes on to write, might be cannibalism. A last frontier that fastidious man has mostly declined to explore. Evil is a different sort of gourmet. And Dark Willard may go on and say, well, here's the weather report. The weather report, there's acid rain falling over Chicago today. There's, there, there, there's tornado funnels expected over Los Angeles. And oh yeah, there were over 150 people that were shot and killed across America for the 4th of July weekend. Dark Willard would be correct. Our world is in evil and horrible shape. It's dark. There's a few areas that are good. There's a few areas that are bright. But why is that? Because what we have learned and what we see is that what Romans teaches. uh, He teaches us that all are sinners. Every single one of us. Sinners who are tainted in every part of their persons with sin. And in fact, the reality is, if we really looked inside ourselves and we thought about this, most of us are not as bad as we can be. But apart from God's grace, many have descended deep into darkness. But there is God's grace. There is God's grace. And when we see God's grace, we see bright spots. Skip Herzig said this, when you turn away from God, you turn on each other. We see that in our world today. Just look at the news. Look at the news. Look at the the sexual uh, predators that are out there. The wokeness in America. The, the, uh, uh, The lying... Uh, from the administration um, saying things about uh, if, if you say something uh, against what they believe, then you're killing people. Um, you, you go and look at all of the 
um, different people that have been m- murdered this weekend in, uh, in, in violent crimes all across America, from New York City all the way across to Los Angeles, Portland. Just la- yesterday, eight people were gunned down in violence. San Diego is crying out for help. And then they say, well, let's defund the police. What good is that going to do? None. We live in a depressing time. And it's because we have turned our back on God Almighty. And now we are turning on each other. And you think about what Dark Willard would have if he were doing the news today. What a depressing job it would be to get up and have to do all that every single day, day in and day out. But you know what? It was worse. It was worse. You think about the pre, what's known as the pre-Diluvian world, the dark willard world of Noah and what he lived in. Noah was the only bright spot in a world of as Henry Morris says, about 750 million people. Because why? Why did he say that? Because man lived longer. We looked at that last week. How many people lived? Enoch himself lived 365 years. How many children could you have in 365 years? Uh, And Methuselah lived for 969. And they would have had family members and more and more and more. And so the object would be that they... They took God's command to be fruitful and multiplied, and that's what they did. Uh, They they were fruitful and they multiplied. Um, And so there was more people on earth uh, before uh, the flood than were actually there when when Jesus uh, was living here on earth. Uh, There were more people on earth until the late 1800s. Um, 750 million. So, um, as, but, you know, as, as bad as our world is today, Noah's days were even worse. And I want you to look at, as we begin, chapter 6 of Genesis. I told you to put something in there. Chapter 6 of Genesis, verse 5, where it gives us God's assessment of Noah's days. In chapter 6 of Genesis, verse 5, it says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man... And listen to all these as, we, as you look this up. The wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every tent of the intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now notice how he's describing this in here. Every intent of his heart was evil continually, only evil. Everything he taught about. So as bad as our world is today... That cannot be said yet, but we are getting close. We are getting close. All of mankind is depraved. All are naturally given to evil thoughts. But it is not true that every inclination of the thoughts of every man and woman, that every inclination of every man's thoughts and heart was when they got up in the morning, was how were they going to survive the day, and who might they have to kill to to survive it. That their thoughts were, what kind of evil can I do today? But that is is their their thoughts in in chapter 6 of Genesis. Uh, Every forming, every purposing of their thoughts, as the Hebrew suggests, was evil. Every thought was evil. And the, the debasement was universal. It was worldwide. Remember, I said there was like 750,000, 750 million people, if, if Henry Morris was correct. In chapter 6, verse 11, verse 12, he goes on to say, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. Now look at the last part of verse 11. For all flesh, all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. 
they had gone the way of Cain, willing to kill, They're wanting their own way, their own desire, their own passions. They had forgotten about Enoch, who was willing to follow him and be righteous. They had forgotten about him. And so Dark Willard's pre-Diluvian forecast would have been routine. Darkness. Darkness everywhere. And not a light to spare. Except for one. One minuscule pinpoint emanating from the wilds of Palestine. And we read that in Genesis chapter 6, verse 7. Let's... um, Yeah, verse verse 7 and 8. So the Lord said, I will destroy man, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. I am grieved that I have made him. Verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah, the bright light in a world gone dark, And it is this singular man and his great faith amidst the darkness of an unbelieving world that we're going to consider. So look again with me at chapter 11, verse 7 of Hebrews. And then we're going to flip back to Genesis 6. He says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to his faith. So the first thing we see is faith's certainty. Faith must have something to believe. And in this case, what was he believing? He was believing a warning from God. A warning from God. Because the the text tells us that Noah was warned about things not yet seen. The primary unseen thing he was warned about was that the earth's population was going to be destroyed by this monstrous, cataclysmic flood. Judgment by water. Now, I want to stop right there and just say a few things about that. Number one, we're not going to debate whether here right now whether or not the flood was real. There's enough evidence to prove that the flood was real. Number two, we're not going to debate a lot of things that take place in Genesis chapter 6 because that's not where our text is from. We're not going to talk about the sons of men and the daughters of God, the sons of God and the daughters of men. We're not going to talk about that. There's three theories out there. You can do that on, study on your own. Don't leave that up to me. You study it. You come up with what a conclusion that you think it's talking about. And you back it up with scripture. And, 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 and if you, you, we really want to get into that, we'll study the book of Genesis at some time. But right now we're in the book of Hebrews and we're looking at Noah and the fact that he was a real person. He bought, built a real ark, a real boat. He put animals, God helped him put, God put animals inside for him. And he actually was the only one that lived through the great flood. We're going to live, at, go with it at that. And we're also going to say this about his family. Um, his family survived because of his righteousness. It doesn't tell us that Shem, Ham, and Japheth were righteous. It tells us that Noah was righteous. It doesn't say that their wives were righteous. It says that Noah was righteous. And they survived because of his righteousness. So, um, so we're going to look at this. Um, this is we've been warned about this stuff. Um, so look with me at Genesis chapter six. Again, we'll go back to Genesis six um, and look at verse fifteen. Um, look at verse thirteen. God said to Noah, "The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood." Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Verse 15. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. Its width, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. In terms, we can visualize this. If we, as we begin to understand it, a cubit is about 18 feet. So it's 450 feet by 75 feet 
wide by 45 feet high. Um, it, it's a half, uh, it's a one and a half football fields long, about as wide as, as a football field, and about four stories high. Now, what's really helps us nowadays to visualize this is just to go across the border to Kentucky, and we can go to Noah's Ark. We can see a replica of Noah's Ark built on the exact dimensions that, that are in the Bible. Um, and Ken Ham and the people there at uh, Creation um, have, have made this, um, and uh, you can see it. And you can go there, and there's the Creation Museum, and they are actually building a tower, the Tower of Babel. Um, they are getting ready to start building that to what they believed it to look like before God came down and uh, sent people everywhere and messing up their, their languages, the languages, so that they couldn't continue on. So, but I want you to think about this. If you were a farmer back then, before the flood, okay, uh, the only flood you had ever seen before, if you had seen any, might have been a, a washer, uh, which came from an occasional thunderstorm. If they even had thunderstorms back then. They may not have had thunderstorms back then. We're not told. But he had never seen anything as big and as massive um, as that. We were, we were at the beach this week and, and going out into the Atlantic Ocean. We, would, we could see steamers heading out, uh, ships heading out. And they were heading out and they were loaded up and everything coming out of the port of Charleston. They were massive. They were huge. But for Noah to build something like that was an accomplishment. Um, he, he, he never seen anything, but he heard God's word, or he considered it. Some, you know, some scholars, um, especially Bishop Westcott, an older scholar who's passed away, he believed that when God talked to Noah, that everybody heard that everybody heard and told him what, what to do. I don't know that that's true or not, um, but Noah heard it. He heard God, and he believed God. He trusted God, and he believed him. And so as to what the look took place inside of him, we're given clear instructions. Because the phrase in verse 11, chapter 11, verse 7 is, he was warned about things not yet seen. And that's going back to verse 1. Faith faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Inwardly, Noah came to possess visual faith, visual certitude. He believed. He saw a terrible mountain of water come and cover the entire earth destroying every creature that has breath of, of life in it. He saw an immense arc of cypress wood, the work of his hands riding high on the tempest. This certitude was combined with a future certitude. He was sure of what he had hoped for. In other words, he believed God. He saw the unseen flood in his mind. For him, the future promise of salvation was so real, it was present. It was present. Uh, and that great belief was combined with trust in God so that he became a man of towering faith. Faith is always more than just a certainty of belief. Faith is belief plus trust. Belief plus trust. In an instant, Noah entrusted everything in God. Noah, I have seen what's going on on earth. And I am going to destroy this earth with water. Noah, I want you to build an ark. A boat long ago before the flood the standard of faith was set in the midst of a midnight of unbelief faith hears God's word 
and puts it in action with a profound certainty. Jesus has promised us. He says, if I go, and he did, I will come again. I will come again. And so he's promised that he's going to come again. And so we have to believe that. that we haven't seen it, but we have to believe that it's going to take place. Noah entrusted everything to God. Have you trusted everything to God Almighty? Faith requires that we believe God's word and we rest our lives on it. The second thing we want to see is not only face certainty, but face obedience. Noah's faith is that it brought obedience. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, did what? Moved with godly fear. He prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Right there, right where he lived. And a lot of people think, well, he was, say, well, he was out in the desert. Well, we don't know that. He, at that point in time, it may not have been a desert. It might have been a fertile valley. Uh, all, all of the wood that he needed, all the materials that he needed, would have been right there around his house, and he just had to go get it. Um, God provided it for him. It would have been right there. Uh, Noah began to take place and start to build this great thing, this great ark. Um, and so the words of our text provide two beautiful insights into Noah uh, and his nature. First of all, there is a reverent obedience. Look again at our text. Look at what he says. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. And I think it's better translated to say he was moved with holy reverence. Because fear does not fit Noah's personality. It does not fit Noah's character. Noah didn't have the fear uh, in the context in Genesis. He didn't fear those people around him. Um, Noah shows us what we need to do. We need to have courage. In our world today... We need to have courage to stand in complete obedience to God and his principles. Noah obeys. Not because he dreads the consequences of disobedience, but because of his reverence he has for God. If there's any fear here, it is a holy reverence and devotional awe of who God is. Noah's obedience is built on a warm heart for God, not a, not a servile fear. It is a loving fear, like that of a child who does not want to displease his father. Noah's obedience tells us that at the very heart of a life of obedience, there must be and there always is a holy reverence for God. We need to beware of obedience that is unemotional, that leaves our heart beating at the same rate before we believe. A reverent heart is a holy point of light in a dark world. Because a reverent heart is an obedient heart. So he had reverent obedience. But then he also had practical obedience. Um, he had practical obedience. Noah got right down to doing what God had told him to do. And what did he do? The second part of that was he built an ark. Why? To save his family. Noah did everything. That's what Genesis says. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. He followed the blueprint prints implicitly. Why? Because it meant salvation for his family. Or it meant death. 
And so as Noah would have finished this incredible 450-foot keel and began to install some of the ark's ribs, you can imagine the abuse he took. Can't you just see all of the memes popping up on Facebook about Noah, on Instagram, on Twitter? Imagine the insults. Imagine the taunts. Imagine the amusements that people came up with at the expense of Noah and his family. You know? The jokes, how many of children how many of Noah's children does it take to Noah maintain his practical obedience? He did exactly what God said. He was obedient to God and began working and he began preaching and he began talking to people about God and talking about the coming dangers that were coming. We've all seen them people um, in the big cities holding the signs, repent, repent, repent. Noah did that and he talked to the people and he continued the work, not for 25, not for 50, not for 75, not for 100, but 120 years until that ark lay like a huge coffin on the land. And so what does this tell us about faith? It always, always, always obeys. It is practical. It is reverent. And true faith always puts their faith into action. And so if we were to bring that down to where we live, we understand that there was no way Noah could truly believe that the flood was coming without doing what God had told him to save his family. So we need to ask ourselves, do we truly believe God's word? And have we done everything possible to help save our family? and our friends, and our neighbors, and our co-workers. Because there is a judgment coming. If we do nothing to bring salvation to those around us, aren't we guilty? Number three, we want to look at is faith witness. There's this beautiful sequence that emanates from true faith. Faith involves certitude of belief, which produces obedience, which in turn produces witness. And that's precisely what Noah's faith did because his witness condemned the world. By his faith, he condemned the world. Or through his faith, he put the whole world in the wrong. This is, he did by, by the witness of his word and his life. First of all, let's look at his word witness. His word witness. Peter tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And that means for 120 years, while he labored on the ark, he preached to all who would listen. And perhaps sometimes he preached from the construction scaffolding to the curious people who would come out to gawk. Or maybe he, he, pre maybe he hired workers. We, we're not, we don't know how he did it, if he did it all by himself or whatever, but maybe he hired workers and he just preached to them for 120 years. But he went on preaching. He preached on, throughout preaching missions throughout his countryside. His message was a call to faith in God and repentance and righteous living. You know, here might be a sample of what he might have said. He might have said, Faithless men, maddened by passions, do not forget the great things God has done. For the immortal, all-provident Savior knows all things. He has commanded me to be a messenger to you, lest you be destroyed by your madness. Sober yourself. Cease from your evil practices, from murderous violence against each other, soaking the earth with human blood. Reverence, my fellow mortals, the supreme and unassailable creator in heaven, the imperishable God who dwells on high. Call upon him, all of you, for he is good to be merciful to you all. For this whole vast world of men will be destroyed with water, and you will then utter cries of terror. Suddenly the elements were turned against you, and the wrath of Almighty God will come from heaven. That might have been something they said, or he might have just said, you know, how long can you tread water? I don't know. You know, I, I don't think he would have said something like that, but you get the idea. 
his word was preached for 120 years to these people to repent from their murderous ways. Second thing we see is life, life witness. Noah faithfully preached righteousness for 12 decades. 12 decades. Along with that was his witness in his life. For 12 decades, the violence continued. The, 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 the anger and the, 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 pervert, the sexual perversion and the, the, the sober, uh, the, the, the drunkenness and the evil practices continued over and over and over. And Noah remained righteous. Remained righteous. Righteous living people will cause people to see the evil in their own hearts. That's why we must always live righteously. And that was the effect of Noah's life. And so what a powerful witness Noah was in the, wor in the word and the life that he preached. Both eloquently condemned the world and put it in the wrong. Some people were probably reproved by Noah's word and walk. Some may have even begun to long for righteousness. But sadly, not one person, not one person responded in a century plus of his righteous, consistent witness. Some people were probably reproved by Noah, by his word or by his walk. Some may have even begun to long for righteousness, but not one responded in a century plus of consistent witness. Pastoring is hard, but Noah's was 120 years without one convert. And in fact, the world around him became progressively darker. True faith witnesses, both by word and by life, are great. But God gives the increase. He, has, he is the one who has the right to give the results. And you must trust him. Faith's inher inheritance is number four. Faith's inheritance by faith. He says, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to the faith. Um, so we see his objective Righteousness. This, this is the author of Hebrews, one and only use of righteousness in the objective. Uh, Paul, Paul's sense of righteousness that comes from God through faith is expressed. Um, I like to call it alien righteousness because alien stresses the fact that it doesn't come from man, but it's an objective gift from God. Um, Paul says uh, and talks about and repeats the righteousness from God. For example, uh, Romans 1, 16 through 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And then in Romans 3, he goes on to say, uh, But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law of the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Philippians 3, 9, Paul expresses a desire that he might be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. That is my objective, to have a righteousness that comes from God. And so when I receive this alien righteousness from God, I see that it's necessary for salvation. Self-generated righteousness is never enough. For it is by grace that I've saved through faith, not by my works. And it is through his faith, my faith, his grace, that I'm saved. So the only way we attain that righteousness is by putting my faith, my trust, 
in Jesus Christ and in the things not yet seen. Believe that he died for my sin and trust him and him alone for my salvation. The second thing we see is not only an objective righteousness, but a subjective righteousness. When we have true faith and we receive the objective gift of righteousness and salvation from God, it enacts in us a subjective righteousness, a righteousness that grows from within. And that's what happened to Noah. Genesis 6, 9 beautifully testifies. And it says, it says this. Let me get there. Uh, Genesis 6, 9 says, uh, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man. He was a righteous man. He was perfect in his, check out this word, in his generations. Right? Noah did what? He walked with God. Noah walked with God. He was righteous. He was blameless. He walked with God toward the same place with God, on the same path with God, at the same pace with God, just as Enoch did. Noah, uh, Noah also walked with God. He lived a beautiful life that pleased God. That's faith's inheritance. Faith's salvation is simply this. Noah was saved by faith. Noah was saved by faith. How did Noah survive the flood? By faith. By faith. That was his salvation. There came the day when the rain began, and it continued for 40 days, 40 nights, without stopping. Scripture says that the water came from below, from, from below and the water came from down from above. And, and the, those who were pre-Diluvians, those people who lived before the flood, began to think, maybe Noah wasn't so crazy. Noah got into the ark, and the joke stopped as the waters rose to their knees. As people scampered up mountains and climbed into cliffs and into caves to hide, to protect themselves from the water that was rising, ever rising. And when you read the story in Genesis, it says that the waters rose over the top of, top of the highest mountain so that all life ceased. All life deceased. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. See, just as God came to those people before the flood, the pre-Diluvians, through Noah, he's also come to us, the post-Diluvians, through his only son, Jesus Christ. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, Jesus has been asked, um, what, what about that, the, the day of, uh, of um, um, what's it going to be like at the end of times? Um, and what are the end of signs? And, and, and what are we supposed to look for at the end of, uh, of times? And, and Jesus says in Matthew 24, um, verse 37, as the days of Noah were. What were the days of Noah like? Violent. Sexual cravings. People changing partners and the meaning of marriage. Violence all over the world. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, what were they doing? They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. What were they doing? Everyday things. The same things we do. What do we do? We eat, we drink, we go to weddings, we go to funerals, we spend time here, we go there, we go on vacation. We don't pay any attention to God Almighty. Look at verse 39. They did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
And consider Dark Willard and his forecasts. They're not so promising, right? Some people have said that the, the weatherman's the only man who can get his job wrong, get, get his predictions wrong uh, 90% of the time and still keep his job. Dark Will, is, his forecasts are not too promising. The world is, well, it's not changed much. In fact, it may have gotten worse. But during the 1960s, there was a song by the Kingston Trio. And they sang this song, and then it went like this. They're rioting in Africa. They're starving in Spain. There are hurricanes in Florida, and Texas needs rain. The whole world is seething with unhappy souls. The French hate the Germans, and the Germans hate the Poles. The Poles hate the Yugoslavs. South Africans hate the Dutch. And I don't like anybody very much. And I think if we were honest, we could look at that song from the 1960s and change some of the names of the people and say, you know what, that's about where we are today. That there is a, a lack of love for man and mankind by man. That man is lover of self. That we are greedy, that we are arrogant, that we are sinful. And the reason why we are that way Because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This dark world is very, very dark. But when there is faith evident in God's people, there is light. And you know what? People are attracted to light. And the name of our church is Light house so my friends I'm not here with you today Sunday but in spirit I am let's be lighthouses let's not cause and show any more darkness in this world let's be lighthouses and show people the way to Jesus Christ why because he is the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through Him. And our world needs to know about Him. Let's pray. Father, thank You for loving us. Thank You for Your mercy. Thank You for Your grace. Help us to be lighthouses. Help us to be light in a darkened world. A world full of violence perversion and hate help us to be love help us to be gracious help us to turn the other cheek and to show the love of Jesus Christ to every man and woman boy and girl that we come across thank you for who you are thank you for how great you are Help us to continue to walk with you on a daily basis. And God, we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Fred, and he can give us the announcements. Um, just keep us in your prayers. Um, keep my daughter-in-law, Heather, in, in your prayers. She was really sick. Um, and so remember her in, in, in your prayers as well. Um, and then one last announcement before Fred says anything. Um, I, I'm, I can't come in for, because I'm going to be quarantined. Um, and uh, Elijah's going on vacation, and Fred's already got plans, so we're not going to have church on Wednesday night, okay? Uh, but there will be someone here for next Sunday. All right, God bless you all. Love you. Bye. Okay. Wow. Modern technology. Um, we will have men's Bible study tomorrow night. There will be men's Bible study tomorrow night. So if you're there, we will be there. Um, when's the next uh, giveaway? September. Keep that in mind. 
uh, hopefully we can work underneath the uh, shelter by that point in time uh, huh hopefully um, please remember Pastor Kevin and Lisa in your prayers remember Heather in your prayers and other than that I don't think there's any other announcements oh yes there is a VBS all those that are working in VBS are going to meet over here right after we dismiss okay let's stand and we'll be dismissed Father, thank you for today, and just thank you for your blessings, and thank you that you love us. Uh, Father, we pray now a special prayer for of healing for Pastor Kevin and Lisa, uh, that you would be with them and, and heal them. Father, we pray for Heather as they were traveling back to uh, Boston. We pray that you would heal her and make sure that the baby is safe and she is safe. We ask that your blessings be upon them. Uh, most of all, Father, we want your will to be done. Father, we pray that uh, we, as people here at Lighthouse, will be a light and that we'll let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify you in heaven. Father, we don't want to hide our light in a bushel. We don't want to hide it. We want to let it shine so that everybody can see the reality in serving Jesus Christ as their Savior. Forgive us where we fail you. Take us and bind us in your love. In Jesus' name, amen.